Well, this is number eight in our series that we've entitled More Than Enough. Eight Sundays that I've had a good time and I hope you've enjoyed it. It's certainly been something big in me since I had my little visitation or revelation or whatever you, however you want to term it. And uh, it's, it's, it's been a growing revelation, I might say, as we go through the example of the children of Israel. Because they are in samples for us, types or shadows for us in the new covenant. Their physical experiences are going to reveal to us things that happen to us in our life and how we need to deal with them spiritually alive unto God, which brings another element to it, but there are type and shadow. And of course, it's all based on God introducing himself to his first covenant partner, Abraham, as El Shaddai, Amen. the God who is more than enough. So we've seen the children of Israel begin their journey to the land of more than enough, the land of Canaan that flows with milk and honey by being delivered from captivity in Egypt captivity to other people's wills and determination of their destiny rather than their being able to do it themselves. And captivity of that sort always brings lack with it. So there was never enough. And then they move into the wilderness where they're free of captivity and now they have an opportunity to experience the presence of God, the power of God, and the miracle working nature of God all addressed to making enough provision available to them, even though they hadn't grown much in God, enough provision available to them to meet their need. And their journey is intended to take them to the land that flows with milk and honey, the land of Canaan, the land of more than enough. And of course, that's representative of the truth that every member of the body of Christ, everyone in covenant with God, has a land of more than enough. There is a promised land for you, a place that flows with milk and honey in a very special way. And so by looking at the example of the children of Israel, we gain insight into the lessons we learn on our own journey to the land of more than enough. And of course, that journey is peppered by challenge. We see things in the wilderness that we learn from, hopefully, we've spent a couple or three Sundays there. Uh, today, we're just going to jump in at the two-year point since uh, they were delivered from captivity in Israel. It brings them almost to their land of promise. Not quite, but almost, a place called Kadesh Barnea. Uh, it is short of the Jordan, a ways back. Uh, but then across the other side of the Jordan is their land, their destination, the land of Canaan, the land of more than enough. At Kadesh Barnea, we have what I'm going, going to call a moment of destiny because the decision they make at this point will forever impact the direction and blessing of their life in many different arenas forever. It is a decision of such monumental importance that we'll just call it a moment of destiny. And every believer, every one of us, has these moments of destiny, not many, but these moments of destiny during the course of our lifetime. How many, you might ask? I, I'm not really sure. It's probably different for everyone. But uh, I'd say, you know, four, five, six, maybe. And uh, these are going to be life-changing decisions, life-altering decisions that we need to be prepared to make and understand how to make good ones because so much hangs in the balance. Some of these decisions you can see coming a little bit, a little ways off, because you know a vocational decision could be life-changing. There are some decisions you can look at, and look at and say, this isn't your ordinary everyday decision. You make dozens of decisions every day. Only gonna be a few of these moments of destiny. 
And some of them, you can see them coming a little bit and, and maybe prepare somewhat. Uh, a lot of them, you're not going to know when they show up because they may often be related to some crisis point in your life or something. But there are some things we can do to prepare ourselves so when our moments of destiny come, when these moments of uh, hugely important decisions need to be made, we'll be prepared to make the right one as best we can be. And if the first thing that I want to mention in that regard, well, I guess even before I mention this, the challenge, though, is still to get to your Kadesh Barnea. You need to get to your, uh, your point, your moment of destiny, you know, uh, along the roadmap of God's plan for your life. You need to know the direction to go, how to get there, and then what your land of more than enough is going to look like. The different elements of that land of more than enough. What's it going to look like? Financially, what, what is it going to look like for me to have more than enough. Relationally, what's it gonna look like for me to have more than enough? And so how do we know these things? How do we know how to get to that land? And then how do we know what to look for once we get there? Well, of course, it's by following the voice of the Lord. He's the one that led the children of Israel through the wilderness and out of captivity in Egypt. He's the one that'll be leading you in your journey to your land of promise. And so the voice of the Lord comes principally in two ways. As most of you know, this has been taught with some degree of regularity, but uh, you have the Word of God, first of all, that gives general direction to all of us about the affairs and direction of our life. And it's uh, the basis, the foundation on which you begin. And then for us in our covenant, we have the Holy Spirit whose ministry to you is primarily a ministry of revelation. He is going to reveal things to you about your path in life that the Bible doesn't tell you, the specifics of your life. Who are you going to marry? Where are you going to live? What are you going to do? What's your vocational pursuit, your ministry involvement? All of these questions specific to your life are going to come by the Holy Spirit. Now don't be looking for anything from the Holy Spirit if you've ignored the Word of God. That's the fundamental you begin with. He's not going to bring the Holy Spirit into your life to show you things or reinforce things to you that you should have been doing. You know, he might come in spiritual dreams sometimes. He may come in a bit of a visitation like I had recently regarding the land of more than enough and my access to it, the church's access to it. Uh, but usually the way the Holy Spirit ministers to you is by bringing desire, say desire, desire. to your heart. He's the one that births desire in your heart. Let's look at Psalm 37, 4 for a moment. The word says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. Twofold meaning with give, he plants the desire, and then if you do as the next verse says, which is commit, trust your way, uh, give, commit your way unto the Lord, trust him, and he'll bring it to pass. But he plants the desire there, if you delight yourself in him. Now, the word delight is key because, you know, that's a prerequisite for him to give you desire. The word delight can be better understood when it says, delight thyself in the Lord. Well, the Lord and his word are one. So you don't see a pillar of cloud or fire, but you got his word. And so you begin delighting in the truth that his word is going to illuminate your path and enable you to make your way into the land of promise. And so you delight in the Word of God in using it to orient the decision-making process you go through each day. And the desires that come to your heart are gonna be God-given. Now there is a competition for your desire. 
The flesh in the carnal nature of man will also create desire. That desire won't be resident in your heart. Only God will access your heart with desire. But sometimes, you know, the mix of the two can be confusing. You can almost always determine a godly desire from an ungodly desire by the word of God. Ungodly desire normally falls in the category of sin. Uh, well, uh, not always because ungodly desire can fall in the category of irrelevance to the plan of God or the purpose of God, like a detour along the way. And sometimes, you know, it's, it's hard to, to figure out sometimes, well, what, you know, what is this desire I feel? Is there anything in the Word about having a desire to fly an airplane? Anything in the Word about having a desire to whatever it is you may desire? Well, I think the Holy Spirit will help you discern as you pray about it and consider it, uh, you know, weed out the little carnal elements that might not relate to the Lord. But it's going to be desire that is cultivated in your heart by the Holy Spirit that not only illuminates your path to your Kadesh Barnea, your moments of destiny, if you want to call them that, uh, but it's going to illuminate what your land of promise, what your land of more than enough actually looks like because everybody's different. Everybody's land is going to look a, different, a little bit different. You're, you've got different likes, dislikes, gifts, talents, abilities, uh, experiences growing up. All of this kind of shapes what you would define as more than enough. And it's the desire in your heart that begins to give definition to it. That having been said, let's assume you've made it to your Kadesh Barnea. Now... Um, there are a couple of things you can do to prepare for the decision that is to come. And the first is having the understanding that you're not going to get your inheritance in the land of more than enough until you've done your part with your company to move them into the larger territory that God wants to take. Amen. So often we, we don't uh, tie our relationship to a company of believers in our covenant called a church to the uh, consideration of our personal land of more than enough. But if you use the children of Israel as an example, you will clearly see that they had to fight the battles and move the company into the land God said they would occupy before God then began to dispense individual inheritances in the land of more than enough. And so that says to us the same today. It is your commitment first to God's larger purpose for you. You could actually say your land has a geographical component to it. Your land of more than enough. The Bible says to the whole body of Christ, go ye into all of the world. So you could say the world is our land of more than enough, but individually or for companies of believers, we obviously can't cover the world, so we have a territory. I'm not sitting here, we're not sitting here as living word in Minneapolis just uh, because the Lord wanted to punish me for the cold, with the cold weather <laughs> or whatever. No, we're here because this is our territory. This is our assignment. We're not just to be a simple resident of the Twin Cities, we're to have an impact right. on what happens in the Twin Cities, the belief systems of the people in the Twin Cities. God wants to expand his kingdom through us as much as he can in this area. And if this is the company that it has pleased God to put you in, if this is where he's assigned you in the body, then it is your contribution to that effort, your supply of time and talent and finance that makes it possible for us to become more influential and take more hearts in the Twin Cities for God. It is your effort there first that entitles you to an expectation that God's going to take you into your inheritance of the land that's more than enough. So the first 
understanding and positioning is to find your territory in your church. Now, a lot of people uh, leave the church out of that equation. They decide they're gonna move to a new city somewhere because it's too cold up here. I wanna go to the beach or I wanna go somewhere warm or I have a job opportunity in a certain location that, you know, that's why I'm gonna go. And that's all well and good. God can change your location in an, in an eye blink. Uh, but the way you know that God's in it is if there's a church there that it's pleased him to put you in, and if you've spied out the land a little bit like you're required to do, and you found that there is a church, and it is something that you could invest your heart in, it feels right to you when you've gone. We have people up here all of the time from other states that say, we're either moving or considering moving, and uh, we heard about Living Word, we wanted to come check it out. They're spying out the land. But to pack your bags and move somewhere and never give church a thought is, that is a very natural thing and it'll leave you in the wilderness far short of the promise of God for your life. And so basically, uh, the first part of your preparation for the land of promise is you know, the territory, and the place that it's pleased God to put you, and now you're positioned for your own inheritance as you begin making your supply in that local church. The second consideration, and this comes from what the Word of God says has to do with our inheritance. That's the way all of this terminology has been couched in the Bible, so we'll stick with it. And he says this in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, Likewise, you husbands, dwell with them, talking about your wives, according to knowledge. And that's, you know, uh, knowledge of the Word of God. Dwell with them according to what the Bible says. There are two Greek words for knowledge, gnosis and epinosis. This is talking about the knowledge that comes from God. And, and then in addition to that, he says, give honor unto the wife, we could stop there for a while, but I don't have time. That also means a lot of things. As unto the weaker vessel, and that's simply a reference to uh, physical capacity perhaps, at least that's what the commentaries say. And here's the key, and as being heirs together of the grace of life. Grace is God's unmerited favor. And that's the only way you're going to experience more than you can ask or think. It's God's unmerited favor that gives you more than enough because you don't deserve it and can't earn it, so it's called grace. But an awareness of this fact says dwell with them according to knowledge, and this is a piece of that knowledge that you best be aware of. Whoever you marry is going to take you into the land of promise to keep you from getting in. Because it says here that you're gonna go in as a husband and wife into the inheritance that is yours or not at all. I guess there could be a fringe possibility, but basically whoever you marry is going to consign you, and these are lifetime decisions. Contrary to some of the viewpoints of younger generations, marriage isn't something you can try on for a while and discard it if you don't like it. For blessing to come to you, you need to see it as a lifelong undertaking. That's right. And so who you join yourself to as a husband or a wife is going to determine whether you live either in the land of more than enough, experience an excess, fulfill the will of God for your life by abounding to every good work with that excess, or whether you're going to die in the wilderness with just enough to meet your need. So marriage is huge. I'm going to address this point uh, and elaborate on it from two perspectives. One, from the perspective of someone that is making a moment of, moment of destiny decision about who to marry. 
I'm inspired to preach this message uh, by a good friend who I know is in that place right now. And, um, you know, when I say that somebody inspires me to preach a message, I have no idea if they're here now or ever will hear this. I'm not preaching to them. But God has inspired me to preach some truth through the overall body that should benefit us all. And this is the way the Lord often works in me. You know, I'll become aware of something that's happening somewhere in the body, somebody's life, and it'll stir me up to preach about something. And this has happened uh, in regard to the choice of a spouse because this friend is in that place and I happen to be aware of it. And it has prompted a lot of prayer and thought, you know, as a result. And I'm also aware of a person who is at the other end of the spectrum, dissatisfied with their marriage, and who is having to make a, a decision, in order to get in my land of more than enough, do I need to leave this person because I believe they kept me out of it? Uh, or do I need to just stick it out until the Lord returns? And so these two viewpoints are going to be dealt with in the balance of the message today. I'll talk first about the moment of destiny that is clear is going to impact everything about your life when you marry somebody. Right. Even if you were to get a divorce, the process of marriage and bringing hearts together or making an effort to, and then if a divorce occurred, well, you don't like it, well, let's get a divorce. And another few years pass untangling the hearts as much as the natural consideration is not only a very painful process, but it can be a very naturally complicated process. So no, God intends marriage to be lifelong. And we'll see that shortly in the Word. So this moment of destiny when you're choosing a spouse uh, is vital, and you can prepare yourself for it. How do you prepare yourself for it? I mean, his name isn't written in the Bible anywhere. Where does it, where, where? How can I prepare for it? Well, what do the desires of your heart tell you about the man or the woman that you want to spend your life with? The man or the woman that you want to spend your life with? Well, the desire that might uh, first be generated would be physical because the initial attraction to someone is physical. And so what is it that, that attracts you to a man or attracts you to a woman? You know, I mean, and don't tell me that physical doesn't matter. Don't be telling me that what matters is the heart. I'll tell you, uh, you know, I was attracted to Lynn because she was knocked down gorgeous when I met her and is still a pretty woman, beautiful woman. But basically, uh, you know, I wouldn't have gone anywhere near if, if I didn't feel that. As spiritual as I am, amen. I sure wasn't back then, that's a fact. Not much better now, but I have improved slightly. But basically, uh, physical uh, traits and characteristics do matter. So paint the picture and the desire of your heart for your, okay, what, what kind of man, what would I like him to look like? Now, you know, get Brad Pitt and George Clooney out of your mind. I mean, there are not enough of those to go around for sure. Uh, but here's, here's the truth of it. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. What is nice looking or attractive to you probably won't be to other people. So what is in your heart? I mean, um, are you a tall gal that wants a tall guy so she can look up instead of down? Uh, or are you a short guy that wants a tall woman because she's got something he wants? I don't, I don't know. You may not care about either of those things. I mean, you may like blue eyes and, or, or brown eyes, or you may like, you know, um, I don't know, skin texture, hair color, all kind of things that um, you may like big noses. You like a big nose. and. Uh, whatever the case may be. You paint a picture on the canvas of your mind of the general characteristics that you would like to see in a potential spouse. And that's all the time I'm gonna spend on that because uh, 
it really isn't as important as other considerations and any more descriptions of, of physical parts could become uncomfortable. So, uh, you know, just leave it to say that there is an attraction initiated by the way somebody looks. And if you have to sit some, by somebody for the rest of your life, you can't stand the way they look, but you just focused on their heart, then, uh, you know, that's, that's just another point of challenge you're gonna have to deal with. So the, the main things that really do matter, you know, we laughing a little bit about all of that, but there are guidelines in the Word of God that tell us what to look for if we want to have uh, our land that flows with milk and honey with our spouse, because you won't get into it otherwise. There are four things that I found in the Word that I want to share with you. The first is the Word. The first is spiritual. You have to be on a, a level spiritual playing field. You know, there have been a lot of people I've known in my time that have said, well, they're not saved yet, but I'm going to get them saved. Well, they say they're a Christian. I'm not really sure, but, you know, I'll take care of it later if they aren't. Or, well, I don't, they don't know anything about the Word, but I'm going to get them interested in the Word, and we'll go from there. The list goes on, and it never happens, at least not to my knowledge. Uh, I can think of at least two couples I've counseled in years past about marriage who uh, were on different pages spiritually. Uh, both of the couples were saved, but they had different persuasions of the word, different ideas about the Bible. And I talked to them about those differences because the principle of the word is that you're only to open your heart to like-minded believers. And essentially, um, they got married anyway, and within two years, they were both split up. The spiritual foundation has to be there for anything else to work because it's the basic principle of life that you have to be in agreement on. Two can't walk together except they be agreed. And that means that that becomes the foundation of how we're gonna do this or how we're gonna do that. This is what God says do. This is what the Holy Spirit spoke to me. What about you? This kind of dialogue keeps a couple you know, in their land of promise. And it can occur without being on the same spiritual page. You know, so if you're talking to somebody that, you know, you know they're saying the right things because they know you're a Christian, but, you know, no, they don't, they don't have a church anywhere, and, and they don't know a lot about the Word, but yeah, I, I, I agree with what you just said, yeah. But they don't know beans. They don't have an interest in knowing anymore and certainly not an interest in finding a church somewhere. Well, these are danger signs. These are deal breakers. If you understand it, if you want to get into the land of more than enough, if you don't want to die in the wilderness short of the promise of God, this is a deal breaker or should be. And then, of course, uh, moving on to the second point, um, is close to the first because character is formed properly by the standard of morality we see in the Word of God. Character becomes an issue. Next, are they a people of character? Are they people, on the other hand, who don't mind shading the truth, lying, uh, manipulating, deceiving, intimidating, in order to control another's life? Are they people that, you know, uh, are open to, subject to, drug abuse, alcohol? Because all of this is gonna come back uh, in the form of abuse of one sort or another. It's going to come back in a, a completely different package then you met him in or her in. Uh, and so are they people of character enough to put other people first on a consistent basis? Now, of course, you know, all of us can say, man, uh, I'm in trouble, you know, because I've got character failings. We all do. If we're talking about, 
adherence to the standard of morality that's the Judeo-Christian ethic, then we all do because we fail from time to time. But the key is, do you ever recognize your failure and get back on the path that is right and committed to it? Character is hard to discern unless there's a longer period of exposure. Because if you're with somebody that likes you, they're gonna say what they think you need to say to ingratiate themselves to you. The real rubber meets the road when the pressure is on the relationship. What are their emotional uh, responses shaped like? How do they come out? What uh, kinds of things do you see when the heat is on? Do they grit their teeth and pick themselves up off the floor and go after it harder than ever before? Or do they sit back and say, this didn't work for that reason, this didn't work for that reason, woe is me. These are issues that are all related to character. And you know, I hate it that, uh, you know, I don't have longer to spend on it than, than this one Sunday because I do have a lot of ground that I wanna cover. But the third consideration is communication. Because it doesn't matter, it's only the love of God that never fails, right? Amen. Relationally. Amen. It doesn't matter how much you may love somebody, if you can't communicate it in a way they can receive it, then it's as good as not loving at all. Yeah. And communication is the only way of solving the issues that will arise virtually every day of your life. Communication problems exist when, in a lot of men, uh, who would be, you know, the strong, silent type. And I guess, you know, maybe men tend to talk less than, no, I know men tend to talk less <laughs> than women, uh, but then on the other hand, it's the women that usually get good at giving the silent treatment, because for some reason that drives the man nuts, you know, uh, but basically, we see these dynamics could work in either, either gender, but uh, this reminds me of a joke. There was a couple that had a big fight, you know, and. Uh, and it progressed to a point of silence. The wife started it. She said she, she quit speaking to the husband. And he said, well, I too can play this game. So he wasn't speaking to her. And it went this way the whole day, you know, uh, the whole evening. They go to bed. They haven't spoken all day. And, uh, but then the husband has a problem. You know, his wife always gets him up in the morning, and he's got to get up at 5.30 to catch a flight and go to a meeting in Chicago that he can't be late for, but he doesn't want to break the silence and tell her that, so he writes her a note and puts it on her night table, her side of the bed on the night table that says, please wake me up at 5.30, gotta catch a flight. Well, he woke up the next morning at eight o'clock, he'd missed the flight, missed the meeting. He was absolutely furious and he saw a note in his night table that said, it's 5.30, wake up. <laughs> Basically, communication has to occur. I don't necessarily think this has to be a deal breaker and the person you're considering, as long as he understands the importance of it and is willing to learn, or as long as she is willing uh, to do the same thing. And so we see then uh, the importance of communication. And the last point of consideration, remember now, you're building your picture of what you're probably Maybe your first or your second, you know, uh, moment of destiny is, and the most important of all, because you'll not get in there without the, the husband or wife. And so you're building this picture of what you want, how you're going to identify that partner in your quest for the land of promise when you see him or her. The fourth point is there needs to be some sort of vision for the family. This needs to be held by both partners, not just one, but a lot of people kind of cruise through life without having any vision for themselves at all. 
They go to work in the morning, do whatever they do, come back exhausted at night, take care of a few chores, fall in bed and do the same thing the next day. But vision is what gives you momentum in a particular direction. And passion is what drives it. So you need to pick a person, whether you're talking male or female, that is willing to establish these visionary parameters for their relationship and their marriage and passionate about making it happen. Or else you'll be sitting in the same condition you're in the day that you marry him or her. And it's important that both have it. What kind of vision does a guy have? Now listen, I'm not talking old school, I'm talking Bible. I mean, I realize that there are a lot of younger generations that, that, that see this as being uh, perhaps, you know, something that the older folks do, but no, this is for everybody. Because you're, you know, I, I married young. I won't say that you can't marry young and not make it, but you know, uh, I look back on our early years and man, God was merciful with us because uh, you know, there were lots of mistakes and lots of things that, choices that were made wrong, but we did survive it. I think probably because both of us are too hard-headed to wanna say, I give, I give up. But then you know, we began to learn some things and the word is time passed. But this is, this is hugely important. Talk to your potential spouse about what vision they've got. For a man, you know, his vision, and this is just not old stereotypes, is going to revolve around being the protector and the provider. That is in the male nature. And I'm not being insensitive to women's rights or anything like that, but that's in the man's nature. And just as much in the woman's nature is a nesting instinct. Does that mean she can't be vocationally oriented? No, it doesn't mean that. But it means that there's something about having a home, not just any home, her home, a home that meets her idea of what a good place to raise a family and live a life is gonna look like. Not just for her, but for the children to come. And you can actually put a dollar value on that if you talk about it enough. And that's the provider's job. So that gives him a parameter of his earning, uh, uh, what he has to earn to fulfill his role in the marriage. And he needs to be able to do it without telling her she has to work. That has to be his goal. May not start out that way, but that has to be his goal. And essentially, you know, you can put a dollar figure to it and he said, okay, well that means I need this much money a year you know, just to meet the, uh, you know, go beyond meeting the basic essentials, have a little more than enough. In the home of, in the, uh, in the arena of a home for my wife and my kids. And then if his current job doesn't produce that level of income, if he prays about it and does a little creative thinking and talking with his wife, they can come up with ideas, okay, you know. You're working for somebody else. If you just keep drawing a paycheck and doing what you're doing, you're never gonna go anywhere. Let's say if you don't wanna change vocations, you can at least begin thinking about owning your own business. Oh yeah, but I tried that, you know, a few years back and it failed. I'd, I'd rather work for someone else. I don't wanna go through that again. Come on now, that's the failure syndrome. Bible says when I fall, I shall arise. And then uh, uh, together, you can begin pressing toward a higher mark than would otherwise be true. The wife's desire for, for a, a home, a nest, whatever you wanna call it, a place to raise a family and kids, doesn't mean she doesn't have vocational aspirations as well. And that's really good. She shouldn't have to give them up if they're important to her. I mean, there are people I know that have invested their hearts in a particular uh, line of work or vocational pursuit for a long time, they love it, well, it will be a point of resentment if you have to give that up because you gotta go get a second job of some other sort to help this guy, uh, you know, cover the bills. You should have an opportunity to, to 
pursue vocationally whatever you want. And if you're forced into a position of never doing anything but, uh, you know, the typical stuff at home, and that's enough to probably fill your schedule in and of itself, it becomes the man's responsibility to discuss vision, divisions of labor, not leave his wife in the spot of having to take care of the home and the cooking and all the domestic chores and the kids and also work a little extra because he's not making enough to cover the bases. That won't get it, not for long. I'm just being realistic. This kind of thing puts stress on a relationship. It only takes a year on average, maybe two, for the romance and the infatuation and the adventure of this new thing to wear off. And then reality is, is there. And the pressure will come on. And so whoever you choose needs to flesh out the parameters of your heart, the desires of your heart, regarding what you want your land of promise to look like, truthfully. And there's some things you need to know that relate to the pressure that's going to be applied to lower your standard, to lower your vision, especially if, uh, you know, you've been divorced and you're older and you want a husband, but, you know, or you're widowed or you're single. You've been choosy and haven't married yet, but time's passing. You know, and the thought is going to come. The pool of possibilities <clears throat> of unmarried men or women is growing smaller the longer I wait. And there's this pressure to lower your standard, to lower your vision, to remove some of the parameters the desire of your heart had set in place. And don't ever do that because it will become a point of resentment somewhere down deep toward that spouse that you do settle for if you don't deal with it on the front end and not lower your, 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 your goals. Basically, uh, you know, you're not gonna shorten God's arm by the fact that there are fewer people out there. He's the one that gave you these desires. That means there's somebody out there that can fulfill these desires because he gave you those desires. So don't yield on any of those points. Hold them up. You want somebody that's intellectual? You want somebody that has a good personality, is fun to be with? You want somebody that is sweet and sensitive and kind? You want somebody that, you know, looks good to you? Hold it up there because God puts these desires in your heart and that means there's somebody out there that can fill them. Amen. Yeah, but I've waited a long time and he hadn't come around yet. Well, you know, maybe you weren't ready yet. You probably couldn't have seen him yet. You probably, I don't know what the case might be and I, or her. It's just a matter of uh, setting standards that you don't move beyond. And of course, this is how you will keep yourself in that place called the land of more than enough. That's how you move into it. That's how you make the right decision at your moment of destiny. That's how it will come. Now let me talk for a minute about the other side, which is you've been married a while and you're not uh, too happy with the results. Maybe you didn't, you know, uh, maybe you moved too quickly. Maybe you didn't spy out the land. That's what we're talking about doing, spying out the land. Now the years have be begun to pass. You're still, you know, just scrambling, scrambling to get your needs met and maybe just a hair over, but not much. And you're thinking to yourself, I got an anchor around my neck here. He or she is keeping me from uh, my full potential from the kind of experience I want to have, from the peace and the joy and the rest. Do you know God defines being in your land of promise as rest? He talked about the generation that died in the wilderness said they weren't going to enter into my rest. Entering into the will of God, the land of milk and honey, is rest. That may, means basically an absence of discontent 
anxiety, cares, uh, an absence of fear, these kinds of things are not present in rest. And it's a supernatural blessing from God when you are in the land of more than enough. And in Hebrews 4, it says you cease from your own labor. You rest. That doesn't mean you retire early or quit working you know, as hard and as effectively as you can at whatever your job is. No, it means you're not doing this. God's doing it. And your job becomes a joy because you know that he's going to faithfully respond. And you know that he is your more than enough. You're not wondering anymore. You're not checking your bank balance and saying, well, he wasn't more than enough this month. No, you know that's what he is. And it brings a supernatural rest to bear. And so if you wanna know whether you're there or not, just check your rest level. That really will tell you a lot. But for a man and a woman that have been married for a season and that rest is conspicuously absent, it, they're reminded every day of how short they've fallen of the promise of God. And the tendency is to, you know, to say, and particularly if there's been strife or, or contention between them, it's easy to say, I think I need to get a divorce. I think we need to split and go our own way. Now let me say this about that. It is God's best for you to stay married now, there are some occasions where divorce, I think, is the only option. Uh, and this is a, an ordin ordinance that God gave because of the hardness of your heart, it says. Hardness of one party's heart to the Word of God or the other party's heart to the Word of God. A failure to respond to the Word's direction and how to treat your spouse or live with him or her but something that doesn't get, doesn't get talked about a lot is hardness of the heart to one another. Sometimes, you know, the, the, the friction and the contention reaches the point where you harden your heart to the other person. You don't open yourself to them anymore. They couldn't speak into your life if they wanted to because your heart's closed to them. You're gonna go about your own way, do what you wanna do. And so God says when these kind of occasions arise, then divorce has to be a scriptural option, and it is. Some of the things that, that fall in this category to me that would require somebody to step out would be abuse, of course, abuse of any sort. It begins on the emotional level, and very often, if it continues beyond the emotional level, it does become physical. Now, not all emotional abusers become physical, but uh, you know the researchers say that physical abuse is always preceded by emotional abuse. And you know, for one person to dominate another in that fashion is about as unscriptural as anything could be. I would say divorce is mandatory in that event. And there are other contributors because drug abuse, alcohol abuse, substance abuse of any sort, alters a person's personality, I don't care what you say. And if that is a problem, and it is something that is becoming progressively more evident, you will see more of these other things occurring as well. And so that would be an occasion. And of course, uh, you know, the absence of agreement on the Word of God would ultimately become a possibility as well because the Bible says that as a believer you can either stay or depart from an unbeliever. You know, that's really left up to you at that point. And if it gets to the point where the fruit is too bad, then again, I would suggest you leave. But for the most part, and this is counter, by the way, to a lot of traditional religious uh, perceptions of divorce. There are some that say, hey, you know, Divorce, that's, that's, that's the, the unpardonable sin. You can shoot the sucker and get off with the church where murder is concerned, you know, but you can't do that. Uh, no, that's not the case. What I've shared with you, I believe, is consistent with the word and how God defines his love. 
You can make that uh, validation for yourself if you'd like. Uh, but then you get to the couple that there's none of these biggies that open the door to divorce. Then how, you, how do you handle that? You just don't get along anymore. You don't sit down and talk anymore. You don't eat your meals together. You don't have any common interests anymore. She does her thing. You do your thing. Uh, the person that I know in this regard is my inspiration for this segment and you know they both are saved and profess to love the Lord uh, you know neither of them are necessarily a uh, letter to the law adherence to the word but still you know that's something they endeavor to do but they just have nothing in common anymore she's got his deal he's got his deal they might pass like ships in the night once or twice in the house during the day they're going to suck it up and hang in there because it would be embarrassing to everybody else to know that they got a divorce because it might, you know, uh, whatever. But, they, but they're at this point. And most every couple that's married will have these thoughts cross their mind at one point in time or another. Should I go my separate way? Or should I stay? And of course, you know, without the biggies that we mentioned justifying a divorce, my strong recommendation is that you stay because you can change the marriage. You cannot change your spouse, but you can change yourself. And when you change the way you're relating to them, you can change their response pattern to you. And then the two of you together, the two of you together can begin, you know, finding common ground again. You used to love to be together when you were younger, or should have. You're nuts if you married her if you didn't like being with her. So there was a point in time when there was enough commonality of purpose that you joined together. Let's see if we can resurrect or, or rethink, you know, what common ground might be now. I mean, the Bible says to men, rejoice with the wife of your youth. That would imply several things. God expects you to grow old together and the tendency when you grow older together and you both start to sag a little bit and wrinkle a little bit, that's mostly a female problem. <laughs> but basically, <laughs> and you look across you know, the room, she's sitting on the other side of the room, you think to yourself, man, she's just a shadow of her former self. Uh, you know, and you know, these are things that uh, you have to change because basically, you know, we, we can be as carnal as we allow ourselves to be. You can think instead about the, the multitude of ways she's been faithful to you over all of the years of your life and given into your success and the things that you've accomplished together. Start being mindful of that and then looking for common ground. Now, if she likes to go shop, you're going to have to suck it up and go shop uh, with her. Um, you know, if you like to hunt and she doesn't, she's going to have to suck it up, buy some camos and climb a tree and join you. I'm just kind of teasing, but the point is there's going to be a little give and take on doing what one another likes. You may not love what you do today, but they do and vice versa. And then you can find some things that are common to you both and you'll be able to enjoy a measure of your life that you weren't enjoying previously. And if you make this a target and make it an effort, I believe you'll get to the place where once again, you can rejoice with the wife of your youth. Don't be looking around, eyeballing other possibilities. You know, keep your focus where it belongs and recognize that God will reward you by bringing you into that place of being perfect and entire, wanting nothing, because that's the land of more than enough. Hallelujah. I've run out of time, basically. And just remember, don't ever let past failure, whether they be in relationships or business endeavors, lower your sights, you know. Uh, a lot of times people fail in relationships 
and it creates a self-image problem. It, it says maybe, maybe, they don't, maybe I'm not attractive uh, to other people. Uh, and a, and a self-esteem or self-image problem begins. And that's not the case at all most of the time. Uh, but that's the way it makes you feel. And so the result of that is lowering your sights again. And if I'm not attractive enough to get this up here, then I'll drop it to down here. Or if I'm getting too old to wait much longer and the pool's getting smaller, I'll drop it to down here. Wrong. Keep the desires that God planted in your heart. Keep them alive. Water them. That's him saying to you, that's your land of more than enough. This dude or this woman is out there. And so just prepare for your moment of destiny.